When I was a kid, I spoke two languages, but I didn't know it. My parents immigrated from India in the 70s, and when I would go to school, I would speak in half English and half Gujarati, my parents' language. Nobody had any idea what I was saying. In fact, I don't think my first grade teacher had very much confidence in my reading ability. I can remember when she was handing out those shiny phonics workbooks and assigning us to different reading groups. The groups had names like the Eagles, the Sparrows, the Bluebirds. She put me in the Turtles. <laughs> Most of my life has been about being in the middle. Going from home to school was like traveling across the world. I went from a group of people that thought I was too American to another group of people that thought I wasn't American enough. I literally have two names. Bivin is the name that my parents gave me, and Bobby is the name that my friends and teachers could actually pronounce. As I got older, I realized that all of us are in the middle in some way. Some of us are the product of different races and ethnicities. Others of us that seem to fit in so perfectly are actually caught between different values and beliefs on the inside. For a long time, I thought that being in the middle was a lonely place. But today, I see it as a source of strength. When you're in the middle, you have to learn the hard way that each side of yourself is equally as important. You learn through trial and error when and where and how to express those different sides of yourself. And you have to be okay with complexity. You have to learn to embrace, embrace rather than reduce the richness of human experience. Growing up, my parents encouraged me to be a doctor. And by encouraged, I mean insisted. <laughs> and so I got my PhD in business. <laughs> and over the years, I've seen that the business world is in the middle of a surprising battle of ideas about its very purpose. And we're making a documentary film about this battle. And when you tell people that you're making a documentary film about the purpose of business, they look at you and they smile. And you can tell that they're thinking, the purpose of business is to make money. Are you trying to make the shortest documentary ever? <laughs> Today, I want to talk a little bit about some of the myths and realities relating to corporate purpose, and some of the things that we're learning as we're engaging in this documentary film project. The purpose of business matters because we are all affected by what companies around the world choose to do. When companies exist only to maximize profits for their shareholders, we get disasters, like the BP oil spill that devastated both the Gulf and BP stock. Engineers at Volkswagen cheat on emissions tests in order to increase sales. Companies like Halliburton lobby the government to bend the rules in their favor, corrupting our democracy. But how do we get here? Where did this idea that it's all about making money for shareholders come from? If we go back 50 years, American business didn't think about themselves this way. In fact, they weren't really concerned that much with profit maximization. Executives saw themselves as stewards of the public good, and part of their job was to benefit society. At that time, executive compensation was based on the size of the companies that executives ran, and so there was this push to acquire and assemble smaller companies into these large and more stable conglomerates. As an example, think of RJR Nabisco. They made both cookies and cigarettes. Someone in this audience just got an idea for a smokable cookie. <laughs> you're going to go home tonight, and you're going to light up some Oreos. <laughs> but take it from me, chocolate chips work much better. So if we fast forward to the early 70s, what we find is that American business was stagnating in the face of new competition from Japan and Germany. And we began to look around for a cure. At that time, economists said, look, businesses are trying to do too much. We need to simplify. And we need to focus on profits, particularly on the share price or the stock price of the company. To avoid being left behind, economists urged businesses to get out of the middle and focus primarily on profits. At first, executives were a little hesitant about this view. But then some economists had an idea, but we'll pay you based on if the stock price increases. And then all of a sudden, people started to pay attention. This idea of pay for performance, if you go back to the 1970s, it was virtually non-existent. But today, half the companies on the S&P 500 have some form of pay for performance. And an average CEO, a third of their compensation comes from stock and stock options. 
Changes like these are directly responsible for CEOs seeing a 15-fold increase in their compensation over the last 40 years. What is so surprising to me is that this is a profound societal change from companies that saw themselves as a part of society to companies that focus primarily on profits. And it was started by a group of academics at universities. Now, as an academic, nobody has ever told me that people actually pay attention to what we do. I'm not convinced that the students pay attention to us. But the students that do pay attention in courses like business, in law, in economics, in public policy, are all taught that shareholders own the corporation and that the primary purpose of business is to make money for them. But it turns out that this view is based on some seriously flawed assumptions. First, shareholders don't own the corporation. Yeah, I'll say that again. Shareholders don't own the corporation. According to the law, public companies own themselves. And shareholders, just like employees or like suppliers, are party to a contract with the firm. Shareholders own a contract called a share that allows them some limited rights under very limited circumstances. What that means is that there's no legal reason to put shareholder interests above everyone else's. Right? It's a choice. It's not a requirement. Many of the students and executives that I work with are genuinely concerned about trying to help the community or pay employees more, but they worry that if they make those investments, that shareholders will sue the company. But experts in corporate law show us that there is no legal duty to maximize profits. In fact, courts have what they call the business judgment rule, which basically means that as long as executives aren't breaking the law, that courts won't interfere with their decision making, even if it reduces the stock price. Now, I know that all of this might seem like boring details, but it's amazing how important thinking about the fine print, reading the fine print can be. We've all seen those drug commercials. If you listen carefully, the so-called side effects of those drugs are actually the same as the symptom you're trying to cure. <laughs> Do you have trouble growing thicker, fuller eyebrows? <laughs> Ask your doctor about bell brows. And then they say very quietly and fast at the end, and bell brows may cause anxiety, nausea, depression, thoughts of suicide, and loss of all facial and bodily hair. <laughs> if you're not paying attention, then you might sit there and say, well, I don't have any eyebrows anymore. Maybe I should take more of this stuff. Taking the medicine of maximizing shareholder value was supposed to help our economy. But today, we know that what was intended as medicine is actually hurting us, even in our roles as shareholders. So for example, I want you to think about the annual average stock turnover. This would be the number of new shareholders a company has in a year. In 1960, that number was 12%. By 2010, it had grown to 300%. What that means is that a typical shareholder holds a stock for less than four months. At this rate, it's soon going to be shorter than a Tinder date. And my wife's sitting back there wondering how I know what a Tinder date is. That's a whole separate talk. This kind of short-term pressure is making our companies weaker. More and more companies are delisting from stock exchanges because they're looking for stable, private sources of capital. Public companies are dying at a quicker rate. Because in order to make their quarterly numbers, they're not making investments in things like research and development or taking care of their employees, all of which leads to long-term growth and health. You might think that at least companies that focus on the bottom line, on trying to make money, at least they're going to be more profitable. But it turns out, across hundreds of studies, there's no clear evidence that companies that actually try to maximize shareholder value actually are more profitable. Maximizing shareholder value is kind of like fishing with dynamite. Say that all of us decided to go out and find the best method of fishing. Some of us might try using worms. Others of us have our favorite bait and tackle that we might use. Let's say somebody, I don't know, maybe this guy right here, decides to fish by throwing a stick of dynamite into the lake. He should have smiled after I finished the sentence. That's OK. He's going to catch the most fish, right? And so what should we conclude from that? Maybe we conclude that fishing with dynamite is the best method for fishing because it allows us to maximize our catch of fish. But what happens after several rounds of using dynamite? We're going to be out of fish. We're going to be out of jobs. And we might be out of few limbs. Let me be clear. No one is arguing that companies shouldn't care about money 
or that if we ignore prophets and pay attention to people, somehow unicorns and rainbows and bags of cash are going to fall from the sky. This debate is not about if we should care about prophets, but how. How can we run our companies so that more of us are better off? How can we fish today so that we can increase our catch of fish in the future? Are we naive to think that we can have companies that can be both responsible and profitable? No. Companies that are doing this already think about their purpose differently. They call themselves different things. They might call themselves stakeholder companies or purpose-driven companies or conscious companies, but they are all united by this belief that managers are in the middle of a series of relationships between stakeholder groups, like employees, customers, suppliers, the community, and shareholders. And these companies have purposes that inspire those stakeholders. They exist to categorize all the world's information or to provide the best online customer service. And to achieve that purpose, these companies think about and work with those stakeholder groups. And we might think that from the outside, it might seem that these companies would have to make some trade-offs, that in order to pay shareholders more, to give them more money, somehow we would have to cut benefits to employees. But actually, what's surprising is that these purpose-driven companies find ways to dissolve or avoid those trade-offs. Companies like Costco, the Container Store, Toyota, SAS Institute, are all succeeding by being fantastic places to work. In retail, employee turnover is over 70%. Costco has a 5% turnover rate. Why? Because they treat their employees as an investment, not a cost. The minimum salary at Costco is $20 an hour. And in addition to lower turnover, retail companies like Costco that care about their employees have a higher sales per square foot because happy employees are much better at making customers happy. These companies are succeeding because they are able to attract and retain top talent. Today's best and brightest are looking for meaning in their work. They want to do something that matters with their lives. And millennials, more than any other generation, are gravitating towards companies that have a purpose that goes beyond the bottom line. In working on this film and speaking with executives, business leaders, academics, and everyday folks, there's a couple things that we've learned that I'd like to share with you. First, if we just pay attention to the headlines, it might seem that business is somehow morally corrupt or inherently bad, right? And surely there are irresponsible businesses and irresponsible business people. But that doesn't mean that all of them are. We have to resist that temptation to overgeneralize. Because if we don't find and start and support companies that are trying to get better, then we lose a powerful ally in trying to address some of the real issues that we face as a society. And many of the managers and executives that I work with are in the middle. They want to do right by their stakeholder groups, and they're feeling the pressure from Wall Street to deliver short-term returns. And by the way, shareholders are in the middle too. Most shareholders are people like us, that yes, we want to see a healthy return on our investments, but we also care about how those investments are made. It's good to know that companies are trying to get better, but at the same time, we're not going to find any perfect companies. As a society, we seem to demand perfection. Take, for example, a company like Unilever. It's gigantic. It operates in 190 different countries with over 200,000 employees. It sells things like Hellman's mayonnaise, Q-tips, and Ben & Jerry's ice cream. I don't know how that makes sense, but that's what they do. Unilever has made some significant investments in recent years on sustainability. They've reduced their carbon footprint and their water usage globally. And they're not a perfect company. Recently, Unilever has received a lot of criticism and negative press about mercury contamination in one of their Indian factories. So how should we think about Unilever given these conflicting perspectives, these conflicting reports? What we find is that some people dismiss the good work the company is doing in sustainability by saying, see, they never really cared about the planet. Right? That was all just hype in order to sell more ice cream. On the other hand, you have folks who dismiss the real issues that are happening in the Indian factory. They say things like, well, perhaps these issues are occurring well before Unilever ever bought the factory. It's not their fault. When we experience this kind of ambiguity, we see what we believe. 
We see what we want to see. And it's really hard for us to be in the middle and hold both of these opposing viewpoints simultaneously. It's much easier to make Unilever into a hero or a villain. Being in the middle is not about trying to avoid making tough choices. It's about trying to understand the issues from multiple perspectives so that we can act more effectively. When you're in the middle, you can see more. You take less for granted. And you can create better options, better solutions. I believe that if we change the way that we think about the purpose of business, we can help more businesses return to the middle and attend to all their stakeholder groups and figure out how to make all of them better off. Many of the things that we value as a society and as individuals start in the middle. Creativity is about connecting new ideas in interesting and disparate ways. Freedom is about standing in the middle of multiple possible futures. Dreams are an in-between state. And wisdom resides between belief and doubt. The world is too complicated to be captured by any single perspective. If we really care about improving ourselves, our companies, and our society, we can't be afraid to stand in the middle. Thank you. The famous movie Wall Street that has the most famous line that we've all heard, that greed is good. Now, that's wrong. Greed is not good. Greed is bad. Greed is evil. Capitalism is and should be a fundamentally moral institution. You must have morals before markets. The problem is that some people have a very narrow view of what capitalism is all about. Basically, just the bottom line. We want to practice capitalism in a way that elevates humanity of everyone we come in contact with. If you're not a good person, you just can't work for us. Those companies that treat their employees as assets inevitably do better. When you are trying to get customer service, I ask myself, why do these people work in customer service when clearly they hate talking to people? <laughs> the Container Store is a great example of uh, conscious capitalism. So here's a company that was founded on the higher purpose, which is around the promise of an organized life. That's why I applied to work here. I've only been here since October, but I shopped here for a long time. And I told my husband, I have never, ever in multiple container stores had a bad experience. Everybody is always happy and friendly. And that says they like working here. So maybe I'll like working there too. The conventional wisdom is if you want to offer the lowest prices, then you have to pay people as little as possible. But that trade-off between low prices and good jobs is actually a false trade-off. Companies have to make great choices that make the job a better job for the person. Now you can pay your employees well. Because now you can offer them meaning and dignity in what they do. Should you think about other people when you're doing your business? Should you try to engage with them as you're solving problems? Yes. But I suspect we've seen nothing yet. 20 years, it'll be the ante in the game. If you're not a pretty conscious business, you're just simply not going to be able to compete. I was looking for a lobster roll one day, and there really wasn't any great options out there. There's all these fantastic chefs, really skilled, that were adding their interpretation of the lobster roll as, and the price was crazy. It wasn't what I was used to uh, finding growing up in Maine, so the question behind the business plan became, why are these great chefs screwing this thing up so badly and charging so much for it? And we opened October 1st, sold over 500 sandwiches that day. So I'm taking the bun and I lather it in butter when we make a lobster roll. Uh, I see a lot of young people who want to start companies and they want to do well and do good at the same time. Well, personally, I want to do well by my shareholders, but I also want to do good for society. We're going to take out a lobster. These were packaged in Maine. It has to start with the question of what do we actually believe? What is our actual purpose, not what do we think it should be. It begins with a deep authenticity. We take the lobster roll, we put it on top of the bun, thusly. The rising generation, which of course is the generation that's going to produce our next set of business leaders, is much more conscious of the social impact of business and much more concerned about it. 
And that's something that gives me hope for the future. Order up, ticket one, lobster roll to go.